today we are very honored to have a special guest on board. He's a Harvard professor. He's also the co-author of the book Nudge from 2008 about de improving decisions about health, wealth and happiness. Wouldn't we all like to know how to do that? He's also right now working for President Biden's office, but he's here as an academic and a professor. Please welcome Cass Sunstein. Are you here? I am indeed. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm very well and honored to be present, even Thank in this electronic way. <laughs> You're so welcome. OK, uh, I should say that I'm honored because of the importance of the topic and also because at Uppsala University, much of the foundational work on behavioral science and behavioral economics uh, has been done and is being done. And I've referred to and learned for that from that work for many, many years. So a particular pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'm going to be doing in these remarks is drawing on several decades of behavioral science uh, in a general way, all of it has implications for our topic of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, what I'm going to be emphasizing is an assortment of behavioral biases that contribute to current challenges, and then an assortment of behavioral interventions that might help, whether we're speaking about uh, doctors or patients or hospitals or producers or businesses. Uh, it's probably useful to distinguish between two kinds of behaviorally informed interventions at the outset. Uh, the first are educative, and I noticed that some of the materials for uh, the, this conference are emphatically um, drawing attention to educative interventions. Uh, a second set of interventions, let's call them architectural, architectural interventions uh, might change the environment in which people are making choices and not give people information they currently lack, simply making the choice architecture different from what it now is. And we have data in many domains suggesting that architectural interventions can often be more effective than educative interventions, though both are a good idea. I'm going to do two things uh, in these remarks. I'm going to say something about behavioral biases uh, that have contributed to the current situation, and then they say something about a framework organizing the research to which I referred, and the framework is going to have an acronym uh, with um, uh, uh, thanks for your indulgence for an acronym. The acronym is FEAST. F-E-A-S-T. I'm not going to spoil the surprise right now about what the F and the E and the A and the S and the T refer to. I'm going to keep that uh, in suspense uh, and we will get there in a moment. Uh, what we know about our species, in particular in the domain of health-related choices, is that people are not irrational, uh, but they are imperfect. To say they are irrational is not very kind. It's also not very precise. Uh, we depart from perfect rationality in specified ways. Um, so to see people as imperfect or boundedly rational is both uh, a challenge uh, for the topic today, and it is also an opportunity. Uh, specifying the nature of bounded rationality in this domain, uh, there are five features of our species that have particular re relevance. First, human beings tend to be unrealistically optimistic. 90% uh, of drivers have been found to be believe themselves better than the average driver. A problem for vaccine hesitancy in some demographic groups is unrealistic optimism about the risks associated with COVID-19. With respect to antimicrobial resistance, many less than optimal choices are a product, at least in part, of unrealistic optimism. By the way, while 90% of drivers think they're better than the average driver, 100% of people think their sense of humor is better than that of the average person. That's unrealistic optimism. 
Second, people tend to suffer or benefit from inertia and its cause and procrastination, which is to say that whatever people have been doing, they tend to continue doing. It's hard to get people to shift. Inertia and procrastination often lead people to stick with status quo behavior, even in circumstances in which a change would be economically beneficial and beneficial as well in terms of health. If we put optimism together with inertia and procrastination, we will get an important clue about the behavioral obstacle to improvements in the domain of antimicrobial resistance. A third of my quintet of imperfections is present bias, which is to say that human beings often focus on the short term, not the long term. There are evolutionary reasons for that. If you're being chased by a tiger, you ought to run and not think about how your retirement is going to go. And the fact that people are present biased often can lead them to choose things which are in the short term quite sensible, but which will lead to long term harm. And I hope it's clear why that is an important factor behind the current situation with respect to, let's say, incomplete responses, phrase it a little optimistically, to antimicrobial resistance. We know fourth on my list of behavioral um, bounds, bounds on rationality, is that people's risk perception is often a product of heuristics and biases, which generally work well, but which can lead to systematic error. This is also both a challenge and an opportunity. In a situation in which people are aware of a concrete case in which something went very wrong because behavior was suboptimal, then people's judgment about the magnitude of the risk will inflate. So if we're aware of cases in which antimicrobial resistance led to very serious health problems, let's say in London, then there will be public and private attention focused on if we are in a place or in a culture in which the problems just aren't available to the human mind, then a statistical demonstration might not be very effective. It might seem like abstraction, and we will not see much in the way of concern or behavior change. The fact that our risk perceptions are affected by what's called the availability heuristic is, as suggested, both an opportunity and a challenge. Uh, fifth on my list, and I'm going to uh, give the full catalog in a moment, I know there are a lot of details here, is loss aversion. Human beings are very attentive to losses from the status quo, and equivalent gains are not as wonderful as the losses are scary. And if people see themselves as likely to lose something, money and health, then they see red in their mind, if they think they're going to gain something, that's good, but it's not as good as losing something is bad. That's the behavioral phenomenon of loss aversion. And some challenges in responding to the risks associated with uh, the current situation uh, emerge from the fact that those responses are themselves seen to threaten losses. And then people think, I'm just not going to change because the loss is really bothered. Okay, the catalog of five includes optimism, inertia and procrastination. We're treating that as one. Present bias, imper imperfect risk perception, and in particular, the availability heuristic and loss aversion. Now we have a picture of our species, not as irrational, but as imperfect choosers. And all of these contribute to the current situation and provide uh, some clarity about why the current situation is in some places difficult and also provide some clues about how we might overcome the difficulties. Now I'm going to shift exactly to solutions 
and I promised you an acronym or I threatened an acronym and I'm going to deliver on the promise or redeem the threat. Uh, the feast framework, I'm going to save the F for last, is a distillation, as suggested, of empirical research in the domain of behavior change and health in particular. Uh, the E in the feast framework wins the Olympic gold medal, and the importance of the E in the framework cannot be overstated. The, word, the letter E refers to easy. And the basic idea is that often behavior change is most facilitated by making the healthier or the preferred course of action the easy course of action. In my prior role as a government official, I worked overseeing regulation in the Obama-Biden administration. And what I heard more often than anything from the private sector, and this really surprised me, what I heard more often than anything is, we don't know what you want us to do. You've given us nouns, you've given us verbs. Some of the nouns have a lot of syllables. What exactly do you want us to do? There's a link between that pervasive question and an empirical finding from a German social scientist named Kurt Lewin from the 1930s who said, when we're seeking behavior change, we often think, how do we push people to do something that is in their interest? How do we push people to act in a way that's healthier? What Lewin urged is, it's often better to ask a different question, which is, why aren't they doing it anyway? And to remove the obstacle. The last 30 years of empirical social scientist has vindicated Lewin's suggestion, indicating that in the domain of health, the idea of pushing people or inclining them in a healthier direction is often less helpful than asking, why haven't they done it before? The answer to that question is frequently make it easy. In many nations all over the world, the take-up rate for programs that promise health and economic benefits is in the vicinity of 40 to 60 percent. That's a tragedy, that 40 to 60 percent. If we could increase that take-up rate from 40 to 60 percent to 70 percent, we could save a large number of lives. The reason the take-up rate is lower than it should be is that it's hard to take advantage of a program. My suggestion is the E in the FEAST framework, the Olympic gold medal winner, is suggestive that what we'd like to see in this domain is the preferred strategies being easy for people to select, less costly, less confusing, less uh, time intensive, just make it easy. The A in the FEAST framework refers to attractive. And the basic idea be behind the A is often if something is colorful or induces some sort of positive emotional response, then the likelihood that people will do the relevant thing is increased significantly. If it looks ugly or boring or challenging in one or another respect, then people are less likely to do it. New Zealand's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has used the A in the feast framework, given pride of place, and that is uh, a very good idea. The idea of social norms is itself a little abstract, and I'm going to specify it in three different ways. We can understand social norms, the S in the feast framework, to refer to descriptive norms, injunctive norms, or emerging norms. A descriptive norm is what people are mostly doing. So if it is disclosed and true that most people are engaging in healthier behavior, then to notify people of that fact can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. With respect to prescription of antibiotics in the United Kingdom, one behavioral intervention was to notify the doctors who were prescribing a lot of antibiotics, that they were in the top 10% of the people who were prescribing antibiotics, 
in a six month period that reduced antibiotic prescriptions by over 60,000 just by notifying doctors that they were not acting consistently with the descriptive norm. An injunctive norm is different from a descriptive norm. An injunctive norm is what people think people should be doing, not what people are doing. And sometimes we don't have a good descriptive norm. People aren't behaving in the preferred way, but we do have a good injunctive norm. People might say, most people think that the appropriate behavior is the following. And that can have power, even if what people actually are doing is not consistent with what people think they should do. The most exciting behavioral research in the domain of the S in the FEAST framework is emerging norms. And I think that's particularly relevant to our topic here if people learn that people are increasingly engaging in certain behavior, people are increasingly not prescribing antibiotics as frequently, people are increasingly wearing masks, people are increasingly getting vaccinated, then the likelihood that we will have more of that behavior increases quite dramatically. We don't know exactly why a reference to the emerging norm turns out to be so powerful, but there are two reasons that are consistent with the data. One is that people don't want to be on the wrong side of history. They think that what is emerging is likely to be wise or informed. And another is that if people learn that a certain kind of behavior is emerging, they start to think that it's possible that what we thought was difficult or challenging actually is happening. And that makes the behavior more likely. Okay, you know about the E, the A, and the S. We only have two more to go. The T in the FEAST framework refers to timely. And this one is easy to overlook. Often educative interventions are less helpful than they might seem because they give people information at a time when they're not going to use it. And by the time that they're going to use it, they've forgotten the information they were given. It's very important whether we're talking about doctors or patients or businesses to provide information right at the time when people are starting to make choices or a position, in a position to frame their thinking, such as to orient their choices. With respect to many health-related decisions, behavioral interventions have been less successful than they should because the intervention was not provided at the time of choice. Okay, that's the EAST framework, which is less full and less entertaining, I believe, than the FEAST framework. The last five years of behavioral research have emphasized the importance of fun. Now, fun is on an extreme end of a continuum where on part of the continuum, it's not exactly fun, but it is pleasant. Let's use the, the extreme end fun. And notice then when people think that vegetables are really tasty and delicious, they are more likely to purchase them than when they are told that vegetables are healthy. Telling people that vegetables are healthy, that's effective. But telling them that they are tasty and delicious, if it's credible, is more effective. In some nations in Europe, the company Pepsi has marketed their diet drink as Diet Pepsi. That's been popular, in some places quite popular but not as popular as Pepsi Max, which is a similar drink with a different name. Pepsi Max has fun associated with it. Diet Pepsi has a kind of worthiness or um, uh, health feature in it, but it doesn't make people smile. The basic suggestion is that interventions that make people smile and induce positive affect are often astoundingly effective. The company Amazon markets certain products 
as frustration-free packaging. I'm just giving this as an illustration. It means that when you get the package, it doesn't have wires, it doesn't have plastic, there is the product right there. There's no frustration. I was intrigued by what this was about, this idea of frustration-free packaging. It's actually about sustainability. That frustration-free packaging means less solid waste, no plastic, it's environmentally better, but it's marketed as fun, frustration-free packaging. I hope this is um, inspiring thoughts in the domain that concerns us today about interventions that use the fact that if people are smiling or if they're laughing a little bit, the likelihood they'll engage in the relevant conduct increases over a situation in which they're grimacing or feeling punished or worthy. They might do it, even so, but if they have a smile on their faces, it's better. In New Zealand, the prime minister has used this as a behavior strength strategy to great effect, saying during difficult times in the pandemic, we're going to have a lockdown, but the Easter Bunny is not going to be subject to the lockdown. The Easter Bunny is going to be able to go wherever it wishes. And the Prime Minister added, this is also true of the Tooth Fairy, who will be exempted. Okay, the Feast Framework refers to fun, easy, attractive, social, and timely. The most important of these are easy and social. The fun part is an overlooked ingredient in behavior change. Notice as well that some of these have an educative function. If you tell people something that's relevant to their behavior and make it timely, that is an educative intervention. The easy part is architectural. It involves creating an environment which is enabling. I might add parenthetically that I'm the chair of a technical advisory group for the World Health Organization on behavior change in public health. And we recently issued a, um, a report on vaccine acceptance and uptake. And one of our principal recommendations is relevant for today, which is the immense importance of an enabling environment. That for vaccination, it's often um, tempting to think about anti-vaxxers and demographic groups that are uh, seized with some kind of conspiracy theory, that is important and relevant. But if you can create an enabling environment, the research finds for vaccination, you can substantially increase vaccination uptake, even among people who you might think are hesitant for reasons that have nothing to do with inconvenience or time. My suggestion here is the architectural invention, interventions that create an enabling environment uh, may have the biggest uh, payoff. Okay, I have one final point for you with your indulgence, which is a relatively new concept. It is sludge. The word sludge refers to frictions, to administrative burdens, to paperwork burdens, to challenges of navigability that often make it difficult for people to get from one place to another. My suggestion is that in the domain of microbial resistance, it's productive to do a kind of sludge audit to ask where are people, whether they are doctors or businesses or nonprofits facing sludge which compromises the E in the FEAST framework and which makes it very difficult or harder than it would otherwise be for people to go in the preferred direction. The United States imposes over 11 billion hours in paperwork burdens on the American people. I'm confident that Sweden does not impose as many as 11 billion, but I bet whatever the actual number is, it's higher than it should be. And I bet also in the domain that we're exploring here, sludge is often a significant contributor to less than optimal choices. And an audit that tries to specify where the sludge is and try to identify how it can be removed 
could produce very significant benefits. Okay, I am uh, done. We've explored obstacles to perfect rationality on the part of our species. We've explored the feast framework and said a few words about sludge. My closing word is uh, an effort to link 2020 and 2021 with the topic of microbial resistance in particular. And that is what have we learned maybe with new clarity is the one thing that human beings are most blessed, luckiest to have. What is the single thing that we are most fortunate to have? I think in this month of 2021, the answer is more obvious than it would have been three years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago. The answer is a four letter word and it is time. Let's find a way, shall we, to give other members of our race, other members of Homo sapiens, uh, more of that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very inspirational about feast, uh, sludge, and time.